G'day, Michael here. This video, initially my purpose for this video was to demonstrate how to fold a bandsaw blade. But it's been growing ever since I started the idea and I suspect I'll cover quite a lot of ground in this video. But um, I've got a confession to make and that is I decided to clean this machine up knowing that I bought it about, uh, about 16 years ago as a very old bandsaw out of a school and I think it was out of the school I went to as, as, as a high school student and I think I used this very bandsaw as a student. I don't know that for sure but I've got good reason to believe it was sold in the town uh, where I grew up and came obviously from an educational environment such as a school. Uh, this is about a 50 year old machine, I'm about 50 years old, and the only school in that neighbourhood that would have fitted at the um, time frame was the high school I went to. So this is quite likely a relic from a high school that I uh, went to as a, as a child. In any case, I've, you've seen my little video series about the, the fence and the tail extension, rah, rah, rah. but the purpose of this video is to how to fold a blade but the reason why it's been expanding is it, it dawned on me that perhaps some of you may be uh, wanting to buy a bandsaw. Maybe you've got no experience with a bandsaw. Maybe you're in the trade and you know most of the stuff anyway, but having a little bit of trouble learning how to fold the blade. Well, I'm going to assume you know nothing or very little about a bandsaw. So if I'm covering territory you're, you're well and truly fluent with, don't worry about that. Just sort of, you know, go with the flow. Um, so, in any case, this little machine, as I was cleaning it, this is part of the confession, um, I opened up the back cover, which I haven't actually done in the 16 years I've owned it, because the machine just works, it works beautifully. In here, I discovered, don't know if you can see that, if you might zoom in. Clear enough, hope that is. A whole set of extra uh, blade guides. They're brass. It may have had a bigger stack on there, but I suspect this is still the original set. The guides that they've got on this machine obviously are designed to last very, very well. Like I said, it's about a 50 year old machine. It was used in a school before I got it. Admittedly, I haven't used this machine very heavily since I uh, bought it. Um, so my wear and tear on the machine has been minimal, but I'm sure it had plenty of abuse in the school. Right, the other thing I found, which is quite cute, is this spare pulley in the bottom here. Show it clearly. Now this spare pulley obviously is intended to be mounted at the lower band wheel, which I'll zoom out so you can see what we're talking about again. Battery's flattening. So this, this pulley, which is supplied, which I was very surprised to see here, is obviously a replacement for this upper pulley. And this has got a lot of adjustment in the motor mount here, which is quite beautifully done. Um, obviously, if I needed more torque for, say, a harder cut, like a, a, a larger curved blade, a stronger blade, put through harder timber. Australian timber, Australian hardwoods are very tough on machines. So this would be you know, to increase the torque available to the lower band wheel to deliver a heavier cut through hard material. So I'm very impressed that this is provided with this little bandsaw. I really doubt whether I'd be likely to buy or be able to buy a new machine of the same class that this machine is. This machine has also got a three-phase motor. So it's, I'm here to work. It's not a toy machine. It's, it's a serious small machine but a serious um, heavy duty a hard worker. And I'm proud to say it's made in Australia. It's actually made in South Australia. By a company called Woodfast. Woodville, South Australia. I haven't bought any Woodfast equipment 
other than this, but if this is any indication of the quality of the machinery, it is outstanding. Um, yeah. So I've plugged forward fast. I don't know whether they're still in business or not. I'm going to have to check them out. All right. So I didn't know anywhere near as much. I didn't know anywhere near as much about this particular machine as I do now. And uh, I really have underestimated how good a machine it is. There's my confession bit over. All right. Now, I'm going to have to change the battery. I'll do that now. Okay. So, I guess I'll begin at the beginning. This is a bandsaw. Bandsaw consists of two major components. Lower band wheel and upper band wheel. The lower band wheel is powered. The upper band wheel is driven in effect by the actual bandsaw blade. Okay. Now, um, the primary guidance of that blade is provided by a tilting mechanism on the upper band wheel. Now, each different bandsaw seems to have a different way of doing that. This one's got an adjustment knob in the centre. Other machines I've used and owned have had the adjustment at the rear. Most of the machines have um, the band wheel powered by a belt driven arrangement. I haven't seen a direct drive yet. So what we saw a second ago on the back of the machine with the drive belt coming up to this lower band wheel is a common uh, drive system. Alright. Now, uh, with any work you do on these machines, I should have covered that earlier, I guess. Any work you do on these machines, whenever you're poking around inside a machine, it's worthwhile to have it isolated. Now, all of my machines I have set up as a plug-in arrangement because being a little business, I have to be very dynamic. I have to, to move the machines around to suit the job. I often am dealing with very large objects. Uh, funny enough, larger factories are more streamlined to certain size objects and they can't handle larger items, which sounds funny, but I've often have had to make uh, specialised doors where the large manufacturers couldn't make it that size because they weren't set up for it. So my little dynamic workshop, I've got all the machines mobile. So as a result, everything is isolatable by a plug. On mini machines, this is now a shop. On mini machines, you may have a second isolate switch. And if they're permanently wired, if you don't already have one built into the machine, get one fitted to your machine so you can isolate it separately from its operational switch. And this machine's operational switch is up here. And here's the isolation switch there, which is basically to disable the machine as a secondary sort of layer of protection. All right, and back to the mechanics. Now, I said that the tracking of the band is provided by the upper band wheel. That is really the tracking. There are bearing guides here and below. Um, when I say bearing guides, some of them use like a wood block, some of them, like this one uses brass bushes or brass guides. And on the back they may have a roller or they may be using ball bearings. Some of them use ball bearings for all the actions. Now I'll show you the setup of that in a minute. But um, do not think of those guides as a tracking component of the bandsaw. Think of them, they're only meant to be there for any pressure you put on the blade when you're working the blade. When the blade is not under any load, the blade should actually not quite be touching any of it. Okay. Now, with all the work that I did on this table and the fence, I actually ended up moving the, the bottom uh, bearing assembly around because the table is mounted on the same block that that guide assembly is. And as a result, uh, the lower guide assembly is a little bit brought forward, and so I have to adjust it back a little bit. Um, I'll take the guards off on the top and I'll show you how that works now. Okay, so I hope that's a reasonable perspective. If I run the band manually, you can see there's imperfections in the blade and it sort of wanders around a little bit. But by and large, you can see there's a bit of a twist on it, the bandsaw blades are not perfect. But 
in essence, it's not touching these guides at all. Not even the back one. You can see the ball bearing there that's running. Okay. So this is actually doing everything it's supposed to. Unfortunately, the lower guide assembly, I'll have to drop the camera. Yep, the lower guide assembly. Okay, so that's a reasonable perspective. Alright, you can see this bearing here. And um, the guides there. The guides are fine. Um, the adjustment front and back, there's a, a lock, I'm going to call it a lock bolt here, and a, a screw for control here. This portion here is the actual tilt control of the table. And uh, I've moved this whole block, sort of rotated it around to get the table uh, parallel with the front face of the bandsaw assembly. And that's what produced my uh, positional error here, which I have to adjust out. Okay, so if I wind the lower band wheel, you can see my hand here, I'm winding the lower band wheel. You can see this bearing here is being touched upon. On and off. Now we don't want that. We want that basically just free. Okay, you can see the weld right there too, funny enough it's turned up. Okay, so I'm going to release that bolt right now and adjust this assembly back a little bit. See how we go. Now what I'm trying to do is make sure that the blade is, if it touches that bearing, it only touches it like once in the whole length, just where there's a bit of a bump in the blade. That's okay. But the intention is that it's basically not or scarcely touching that, that bearing. There's a touch. There's a touch. It's basically as it goes around past that joint. That's reasonable. Let's see what it's doing below. Light in there. Awesome. Scarcely touching. Don't think you're using. I can actually bring that assembly forward. There's something. just making contact, which is basically perfect. It's only just making contact. We want no pressure on that bearing. Tighten that up now. Now with any tightening process, you end up um, moving things around in the process of locking things. So I'll just double check that that's behaving itself. It's just nicking it. Only just. That's about as good as we can expect the tracking to be. Okay, so now we've got that. What I'll show you, I've got those two bearing assemblies where I want them. I'll close that cover. If I tighten this little knob here, hand wheel kind of arrangement, it will pull the blade back more firmly against the running. You can see that bearing running, I think, in the video. Let me get my fingers. Yes, you can see the bearing running hard. If I loosen that back off, it's only just touching it. Loosen it off a bit further, the track clear. Here it's, it's gotten quieter. 
All right. Now, that appears to be about where I want it. The other thing that's kind of hidden in the design here is there's a convex edge on the band wheels. The band wheels have got a rubber tyre. Now, they're both convex. If you know anything about uh, flat belts and how they drive, a convex belt, a convex pulley, um, makes the belt find its way to the peak of that convex. So hidden in the design is already a sort of a, a tracking aid. So the bandsaw blade is completely tracking by this upper band wheel and that hidden little secret doming that's in the wheel. Um, and these guide assemblies are only for the purpose of taking the pressure of you actually cutting and turning and so forth. That's an important detail of the bandsaw. Never think that these bearings are designed to hold the tracking. That is not their purpose. Their purpose is to take pressure. All right, now what I'm going to do um, is take the blade out. Now to do that, many of the machines have got this back to front compared to this machine, so whatever my handing is here may not be relevant to your machine. But I'm unscrewing, like, uh, well, like I was turning on the tap, if that makes sense. Now this knob is not directly pushing that pulley. It's pushing against a spring which then provides tension on that pulley assembly. So it's not a very direct feel. It feels kind of weird as you're adjusting it. Anyhow, that's loose. Right. Now we're on to the purpose of this video. Let's see if I can get that in a better spot. Um, This is a little bit tricky to do. It's not a hard task, but it's a bit tricky to get your head into how it works. Now, the way I was taught, put your thumbs like that, you wind in and kind of cross your, the back of your hands over like that, your, your palms. Okay, so that's, there we go. And being a small blade like this is actually quite strong, but a longer blade of the same width and thickness. See that? Keep wanting to move forward, because backwards I need to go. Oh, there we go. See that? I don't know how to explain it so much as actually do it. Oops. Strong plate. Okay, so there you have that folded up. Now that makes it very portable. Good to put in a little box or for shipping. Uh, good for storing on a hook. Basically makes a bandsaw blade quite compact. Even a large bandsaw blade becomes a very small little spool. So undoing it is a similar process in reverse. But keep your hands on the blade because it can flick around. You don't want it in your face. Um, okay. Now when undoing the blade, it's quite easy to have the handing wrong. I'll zoom in on that so you can understand what I'm talking about. You see the blade? where the teeth are. They have to be travelling down obviously on the side. That would be the front edge on the bandsaw blade. It's possible to turn the blade inside out. So that, let me just focus on the machine. Okay, it's possible to have the blade turned inside out so that when you put the blade in, the teeth are actually pointing upwards, which is not what you want. You obviously want to have them so they're cutting on the downward pass. Okay. Every time you change the blade, the tracking behaviour will probably be a little bit different. Um, and certainly between blades, there'll be a difference in the tracking because of the way the welds work and any tensions that may be in the metal of when they made the blade. There's all sorts of little things that add to a discrepancy. Okay. Yeah. 
tension on it so the lady behaves herself. Yeah, video just ran out. Okay, so I've brought the tension up to a point where there's, I'm going to say with two or three kilos, I've got about 10 millimetres of deflection here. Okay, I guess that's the easiest way of talking about it. Um, kind of a nice hand pressure. Pardon me, you should give about that half inch, you know, three eighths of an inch or 10 millimetres of deflection. It doesn't want to be, you do strum it. It wants to be a fairly low frequency. It doesn't want to sound like a violin string going cluck. It wants to be quite a low, quite a low twang. More like a bass guitar kind of thing. All right, I'll put the guard on. Um, I'll give it one more little spin. Actually, I might do that now before I get too carried away. It's, if you listen, you can hear whether it's touching things. Um, but it's running very quietly, which means it's only well, it's tracking quite well. I'll double check from the side, as we did before. I think I might send it back just a little bit. We definitely do not want continuous pressure on these backward uh, on the back bearings. We want to have them pretty well. I don't know whether you can hear that, but it's freewheeling, and that's kind of the condition we want. these guards up. Now the machine is on the trolley so it's not entirely stable but let's hope that it's going to be stable enough for the job. Pressure well. Okay, so that's the top side of the cut, the bottom side of the cut, that's nice and consistent. Well I guess that's it for this video, I hope that was of use to you and of interest to you. Uh, feel free to like, share, subscribe, ask a question, leave a comment, make a suggestion for another video you might like to see. Well that's it, bye for now.